Hello and welcome back and today I'm going to do a quick impromptu video because right now I'm at Beijing airport after Computex and I'm waiting for my plane and I thought you know what I want to talk about SSDs I've got some time to kill and there are a lot of SSDs at this show this year and although we've talked about Gen 5 SSDs a lot in 2023 I would say that Computex is where we started to see not only some of the cutting edge stuff but we started seeing a lot more of the consumer grade stuff in the Gen 5 arena for SSDs and something that I think a lot of us have been waiting for when everything we've heard about in the PCIe Gen 5 times 4 SSD generation have always seemed so fantastically out of reach. So in this video I'm going to talk about every single one of the Gen 5 SSDs I saw at Computex one by one and we're going to talk about what stood out for them and in some cases what did not. So let's crack on with number one and that was of course probably the one that you've heard about the most in a lot of Computex coverage. It's the one that's been on pretty much all of the mainstream media that attended the event and that was the a data project neon storm this was a water cooled m2 mvme they even had a giant kind of large scale version of it in the middle of their stand and this ssd here arriving of course in gen 5 times 4 has two very unique elements going for it number one as mentioned water cooling a two fan module with water cooling within its very specialized casing something although it's not you know it's not unheard of in the realm of super fast mvmes this is very much the first time we've seen an inclusive Gen 5 water-cooled heatsink. The other thing that really stood out for me on this SSD is it was one of the first I've seen utilizing a non um Fison E26 controller. It's arriving with the Silicon Motion. It's arriving with the Silicon Motion SM2508. And this controller and improvements in NAND uh, layer quality that have arrived recently resulted in this SSD um, cracking out according to them reported maximum performance of 14 gigabytes a second that's 1400 megabytes sequential read and sequential write at 12 um, gigabytes per second or 1200 uh, 12,000 megabytes per second so that kind of puts it possibly as the fastest grade uh, Gen 5 SSD in the market right now, if those numbers are to be believed. And although we will talk about a lot of different SSDs in this video, it is worth highlighting that with regard to their maximum benchmarks, they are going to be in optimal system environments there. So you're going to need some serious hardware to hit those numbers when you get a hold of these SSDs. And bear in mind, again, we are still in kind of the first gen, really, of Generation 5 SSDs. And therefore, we're not really seeing the muscles really getting taught on what these drives can do. Now, this drive arriving in uh, capacities all the way up to 8 TB, which really surprised me, more so than most of the other factors about it. We know it's 3D TLC LAN, probably a 232 layer, and again, it's arriving in that water cooler uh, based uh, heatsink there, but that wasn't the only SSD they showed. That is right, they also showed off a slightly more, I would say, domestic and, I hate to use the word predictable, but certainly a much more um, approachable SSD with specifications that we're a lot more familiar with and this was the Adata Legend 970. Now this SSD does arrive with that Fizon E26 um, controller there so again we know a lot about the capabilities of that controller but once again as this is not part of that first wave of drives that arrived consequently it's got some of the improvements that have been made possible thanks to uh, improvements within layers of TLC NAN being pushed out there with a 10 gig over 10 gig sequential read write. It's a pinch higher than some of the early gen 9000 drives that rolled out on the scene, at least a sequential write. As mentioned, it's arriving with the uh, E26 controller there, and I will say that it's only arriving currently in 1 and 2 TB modules planned there, obviously with the 2 TB with a higher performance number there. Again, there's not much more we can talk about with this. There's been a lot of E26 controller SSDs. It's got 1.4 million IOP 4K random read and write. And the heat sink on it is nowhere near as OTT as that of the Neon Storm. It's a fairly standard class heat sink there. But let's move on to Patriot. 
Patriot. Now, Patriot was a brand that joined the PCIe Gen 4 generation. Um, they didn't really expand within that envelope too much, and indeed, they're still rolling out several rather impressive Gen 4 SSDs. Currently, there were some of those at the show, but when it comes to Gen 5, we've got the Viper PV553 from Patriot. They're another E26 controller SSD, another 3D TLC NAND, and this one arriving at 1, 2, and 4 terabyte capacities. Obviously, 4 TB, highest performance there. Uh, with DDR4 memory on board, but we didn't really get clarification of whether that memory is kind of going the double up factor we've seen of some of the other E26 Gen 5 SSDs out there to crank out just that little bit more performance. But that said, it, they might have done it because the performance on this definitely scales higher than a number of other E26 controller SSDs right now, arriving at 12.4 gigabytes per second sequential read and 11.8 gigabytes per second sequential write. It has a fairly modest heatsink there, although it does have an integrated fan and it's quite compact for what it is, but it's still a very impressive looking SSD. And given its similarity in hardware architecture to a number of drives on the market at the moment, it's pretty impressive that they've managed to get it that compact and still hit those performance numbers. But again, that may come down to improvements in layer count there on, an, on the NAND. But talking about improvements and changes, the other drive at the Patriot stand is a prototype drive, and that one is a DRAM-less um, Gen 5 SSD. Now, for those that aren't aware, um, SSDs, not unlike the computer that you might be watching this on or your phone, are generally made up of not dissimilar components. The CPU of your computer, well, that's comparable to the controller on an SSD. Your storage drive, your hard drive, your SSD, well, that's the NAND on an SSD, on an M2 NVMe where the data lives. And an SSD normally has an area of memory known as SDRAM or DRAM that's, again, much like the memory on your computer, ultimately the hands to take care of active operations at any given time. Now, DRAM-less SSDs have grown slowly via popularity, although there are ways and means in which they can be useful. Case in point, DRAM-less SSDs generally arrive at a more affordable price point. They also have a more efficient power consumption overall, although they don't have the same sustained performance over time. And without sufficient heat dissipation, they can overheat quite significantly and therefore they will throttle internally. Um, now, and when Gen 4 rolled out, it took about a year and a half before we started seeing real um, DRAM-less SSDs arrive in the Gen 4 scene. And here we are on the Gen 5 scene with barely any actual drives available for sale. And we're seeing experimentation with a DRAM-less SSD, with Patriot being uh, Patriot Viper being the first ones to really reveal this. However, Although they didn't say which SSD controller they're utilizing, we can make a damn fine educated guess thanks to Fizon. And Fizon rolling out the, I'm going to get the model ID right, the PS5031 E31T. That is their DRAMless Gen 5 controller. And given that it seems like it's the only DRAMless Gen 5 controller in the market, it's almost certainly the one that they're going to be utilizing here. But what's really impressive is this SSD they report will hit performance numbers of 12 gigabytes per second sequential read and 10.5 gigabytes per second sequential write. Now, those are actually higher than a lot of Gen 5 SSDs in the market right now that have got memory on board. Now, no one was really able to tell me at the stand how they intend to hit those numbers. Now, in the right system that takes advantage of HMB, host memory buffer, that's when you're going to use an area of the system's memory to make up the shortfall on the SSD. Even then, it was I can't really see how it, they're going to be able to hit those numbers. And indeed, in terms of IOPS, based on that Fizen C um, controller spec, it's 1.5 million over 1.5 million 4K random IOP. That's still very high for a DRAM-less drive, Gen 5 or not. And again, slightly higher than a number of SSDs in the market with memory. So this is going to be quite dependent on the system it's inside. And also, this drive's going to get hot, sustained operation or not. So it's going to be very interesting to see what Patriot do about heat dissipation on these drives. But for now, let's move over to Team Group. Now, Team Group revealed their Team Group T-Force Cardia Z5 drive series. Again, another Fizon E26, 
another uh, DDR4 memory SSD and this one they reported having performance numbers of 14 gigabytes per second sequential read and 11 gigabytes sequential write but what was really impressive is theirs was one of the few stands that had real benchmarks happening constantly over and over again on drives in their system so they were able to show the proof in the pudding something we didn't really see on a lot of the other stands when they were showing off their SSDs with live demonstrations something that was really really impressive now this SSD with those numbers that's a good thing to write home about but what was really impressive for them and you may not agree with me is they had the most comprehensive range of heat sinks on show now heat sinks are not sexy they are not interesting but in the gen 5 generation they are crucial you're gonna need a good heat sink and t-force um cardia series and indeed their whole range of ssds i want to get the name right the dark airflow series of heat sinks arrive in a variety of different flavors there are tower waiver stacked ones ones that have got um copper heat uh, copper heat dissipation pipe all the way through and inbuilt fans within the middle of the heat sink but on top of that they had their own optional water cooled heat sink now i know we already talked about project neon storm earlier on which arrives with a, a water cooled heat sink but this is one where it was an optional extra that arrived in an additional cpu fan with two pipelines for the water cooling solution into a massive framed metallic heat sink there for the water cooling to work throughout the casing again their ssd the e26 one there it's you know pretty impressive it's the e26 it's got decent numbers on show there and it, they were the one that doing for me the most convincing demonstration of the performance but what really stood out for me at their stand was just how seriously they were taking heat dissipation there and another Fizon E26 controller SSD, and this time from Gigabyte. Now, before we go any further, a little history lesson. When it came to some of the earliest first generation of the Gen 5 M2 NVMEs that rolled out, there was a handful of brands that got there before anyone else. And one of them was a Gigabyte with their Aurorus or Aurus 10,000 drive, called the 10,000 because of the sequential read-write performance it was achieving there. Now, one of the prices that brands have when they get to a new technology before everyone else is everyone else has then got a bit of time to take a bit of a run-up as the technology gets a little more matured and the surrounding efficiency and development improves as well. The result is that Although they were one of the first to bring their 10,000 to market, the technology improved. And that's why um, Gigabyte rolled out the Aorus or Aurorus 1200. And as you can tell, yes, it's because the performance numbers are better. It's using the same controller, that E26, but this time it's able to crank out, they state, 12.4 gigabytes per second sequential read and 11.8 gigabytes per second sequential write. A noticeable degree higher than the numbers of the, 10, uh, the 10,000 series there. Now, again, whether this makes the 10,000 series redundant, given it's literally only just come out, who's to say? But the rest of the specifications, and indeed the heatsink is not is largely identical to the one that was on the 10,000 series there. And it just feels a lot more like this is almost invalidating the most recent release from gigabyte there so as good as the specifications are in my eyes i think it's a real shame that they kind of undermined their own product so quickly now the next two entries are when things are going to get just a wee bit enterprise and we're going to start with coaxia again big name in enterprise level ssd storage a big name in pretty much data center flash storage and fabric and unsurprisingly they have made big waves in the gen 5 generation and this is with their cm7 series now arriving in a u.3 slash sas external gen 5 architecture and even an E3S version there for that great hot swappable higher capacity better heat dissipation methodology that NVMe is slowly evolving towards. This is allowing a lot more data centers to jump on board with the Gen 5 series and take advantage of those great performance numbers. But as this is a um, enterprise grade SSD, there's also the durability to match. So arriving with proprietary level components internally so it's very hard to get them identified 
there were some other things such as the 112 layer confirmation of coaxa uh, NAND and then on top of that there is the reported max transfer speeds of 14 gigabytes per second sequential read but only 7 gigabytes per second sequential write. Now a big part of that is to do with that durability factor there. Now across the ranges depending on the capacity you go for starting at 1920 gig all the way up to 30,000 gig so well over 30 TB this SSD also arrives in durability factors of either 1.0 drive writes per day all the way up to three drive writes per day that means you can refresh the full capacity of these drives every single day and it will still last a lot last the lifespan that it's denoted for so again enterprise grade gen 5 ssds are now starting to become more apparent and although they were already rolled out secretly to select partners at, to partners at data center level we're seeing it more and more exposed as this technology moves forward for the data center which brings us to the other data center class ssd that reared its head at the computex 2023 show the samsung finally we've seen the pm1743 u u3.s uh, ssd actually appear this thing is like vapor and although it's been revealed at a few trade shows and in several press releases by samsung seriously it was the first time i've actually got to see one of these now at seven millimeter height it is not a big drive and it's taken advantage again of that u3 um u3.s ssd um, architecture there for hot swappable NVMe connectivity again going all the way up to 15 terabytes and starting at one terabyte with a 14 gigabytes per second report sequential read and 7.1 gigabytes per second sequential write so clearly the durability is going to be pretty darn high as well for this kind of enterprise class flash storage they even went on to highlight that the uh Although they didn't state the drive rights per day, they did rate uh, the um, IOPS at 2.5 million um, 4K random IOPS as well, so in terms of read. So again, some great numbers. When it comes down to it, at Gen 5, your big names in terms of commercial storage, WD, Samsung, Seagate, none of these brands have rolled out a consumer-grade M2 NVMe at Gen 5 yet which is really odd but you can definitely see them focusing on the enterprise tier first because that's where the money is but before we end today's video i want to talk about a quirky little drive and what it means for gen 5 which brings me to a drive that i'm willing to bet most of you have not heard of the clev cras c950 now i've said a lot of words there and you didn't know most of them now clev is an ssd brand predominantly found in the east and you know more specifically taiwan they're running uh, rolling out an e26 controller ssd there the same NAND as everyone else one two four tb there performance at 12 gig over 11 gig sequential read write respectively at 1.4 and 1.5 mil um 4k random iops there you might be thinking well that sounds pretty much like all the other beige gen 5 ssds that you've spoke about so far why are you talking about this one now well specifically because this is a great indication that Gen 5 M2 NVMEs are going to become a little bit more affordable relatively soon. When Gen 4, Gen 4 first rolled out in 2019, um, you know, even very, very late exposure in 2018, the early generation units were frightfully expensive. And we didn't really see movement on the pricing until we started seeing the lesser known brands make their version under their label they were still using the Fizon e16 and e18 eventually at the gen 4 level but it wasn't until the other brands started using that architecture more liberally that we saw the pricing come down and that's why i bring up this ssd because although the hardware specifications aren't breathtaking they're a good indication that Gen 5 SSDs are going to become more affordable. They're going to become more available. And we're going to start seeing more competitive pricing and availability that very soon. And with that, there'll be the evolution into the next evol the next gen of Gen 5 where we start to see that full potential bandwidth of Gen 5 times 4 get a little bit more saturated than it is right now. But this has been every Gen 5 SSD that I saw at Computex 2023. Did I miss one that you read about online? Let me know in the comments. There should be an article about this live soon, so do check that out where we've got all of the specifications detailed for each drive that we know so far, and we'll update it when we can. But apart from that, thank you so much for watching all of these videos over Computex. I really hope you've 
enjoyed them. Again, we will be doing this again next year, no doubt. We covered a lot of stuff. I've got all kinds of stock footage to go through. There were lots of videos I didn't make yet, which I will be addressing when I get back to Blighty. But apart from that, thank you so much for watching. Have yourselves a great weekend, and I'll see you next time.